Hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Samuel Center and Mark and Madison. How are you both doing? Doing well, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Awesome. Okay, so we're talking about this book today, The Odes of Solomon. I have a link uh, to it uh, in the description below. So what's going on with The Odes of Solomon? Mark? Well, the, the Newer Project is a, a collaborative effort uh, yeah. between Samuel and I. And uh, actually, this was a great way that we um, managed to uh, work through the pandemic when everybody was stuck at home. And Samuel actually approached me about the project with a great um, proposal. He said, if you would be willing to translate the Greek and uh, Coptic odes, I will translate the Syriac ones. And that sounded like a really good deal because there are only five Coptic ones and one Greek one and 39 Syri uh, 40 Syriac ones. So Samuel got the lion's share of that part of the deal. But it was a it was a fabulous experience um, to to work on this e uh, effort collaboratively and to compare the different versions and work through some you know some pretty thorny issues of translation. Yeah, they're they're basically what have been called the earliest. Uh, collection, right? at least collection of Christian hymns, right? But uh, they're somewhere uh, in the early second century of the Common Era. Uh, it's, of course, with this type of literature, it's impossible to, to date uh, things exactly, but uh, more or less, uh, I, I would say early, what, the first quarter right, of the second century of the Common Era. And so this is a time when I think for a lot of geographical areas, if not most of them, there's really, there's still no ironclad right, distinction right, between, between Jews and Christians. Right? And these are what have been called, Char uh, James Charlesworth has translated these some decades ago. He's called them Jewish Christian. That's right. So written by people in the Jesus movement who have some kind of attachment to Judaism, right? And so uh, what makes them uh, fascinating for me personally, I mean, if you look at it from a, from a Jewish perspective, is that uh, Charlesworth uh, makes a good argument that these odes echo some of the Qumran hymns, right? The famous hymn scrolls, 1QH, and the, the most um, significant fragments or, or uh, re remaining um, fragments, right? it's called 1QHA with the superscript A. And these for a long time, most scholars thought that the Qumran Thanksgiving hymns right, were written by the teacher of righteousness, the founder of the Qumran community. But uh, there's a tendency now, with, which I agree with, there's a tendency now among scholars to see them not as being written by the founding teacher of righteousness, but somehow put into his mouth, right? So in an act of um, homage right, to the dead founder, right? And uh, so this is fascinating because when you look at the Odes of Solomon, this is uh, very much the model that you see in there, but now it's, it's, these hymns are not being put into the mouth of the teacher of righteousness, the founder of the Qumran group, but it's clearly these these odes of Solomon are written as if Jesus, right, is singing them, as if they were written by Jesus. So they're put into the mouth of Jesus. So who knows? Maybe the author thought he was channeling uh, the spirit of Jesus, or the spirit of Jesus possessed him, or whatever. Uh, it's, it's impossible to know, but uh, it's. It's interesting because they they echo the Qumran hymns and they're doing this similar thing. Here we have a dead founder. Of course, he's, uh, Christians believe him to be alive, right, resurrected, but uh, basically a dead founder of a new group, the Jesus group, right, and these hymns are, are as if spoken by Jesus, but with an alternating, uh, a, a very interesting... Um, technique of an alternation between the voice of Jesus, even though he's never identified, 
but it's quite clearly that's that's the person who is meant to be singing these odes. But an alternation between quote unquote Jesus uh, and then um, a narrator, let's call it right. So someone sort of introducing um, this Jesus ode, right? That's going to come up in the midst of uh, the various of the forty-two odes, as they're called, odes of Solomon, right? And then sometimes there are what look like community uh, doxologies, right? So the, the community then says something like, uh, you know, glory to the Lord most high, right, as a conclusion. So it looks like a liturgical piece, right? But highlight, highlighted uh, in each of these hymns would be the Jesus speaking in various ways. Also, to build on that thought, uh, it's, it's interesting when you look at the work of Charles Worth and others, there is often a tendency to uh, go through the odes and try to segment off which ones seem more Christian, which ones seem more Jewish, which ones seem quote unquote Gnostic, you know, and this, I think, uh, illustrates some of the problems we have of our essentialist categories when we try to impose uh, current conceptions back on the second century uh, communities. And uh, we, I think it, it shows, it provides a, a challenge for us to see what sort of movement was this. It's not something we recognize uh, clearly as uh, a Christian group that we would see in the West, for example. Uh, there are uh, features of this text that are just so different and um, really show us a, a, a great window into this early community that, uh, as Samuel says, this was a this was a, uh, a faithful Jewish community, and yet there were also Jesus followers. And there are themes that we find in the odes that are consistent not only with the Johannine materials of the New Testament, but equally of the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, and themes that some folks traditionally have identified as quote unquote Gnostic, which I think yeah, helps to uh, to beg the question of what these different categories are. Yes, well, you, know, you can find in the in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in some of the Qumran literature, including the Thanksgiving hymns that I've mentioned to you, these various tropes, tropes uh, with a very he very heavy emphasis on dot knowledge, like the Hebrew word for knowledge, and light symbolism water symbolism. But anyway, there, there's this core group of tropes and images that we find later in quote-unquote Gnostic literature, many of them, including Mandaeans, right, and then even the some, you know, the materials, uh, for instance, throughout the Nag Hammadi library. And uh, scholars, right, can s sort of trace this line of is an ideational continuity, if not necessarily direct literary or historical continuity, right, between uh, the, these core groups of, of images and tropes from Qumran right on into like, Manichaeism, Mandaeism, other, you know, like um, Valentinian documents, etc. So it's very fascinating, though there's nothing explicitly or I would say fully quote unquote Gnostic in the Oaths of Solomon. There are some terms in there like the middle, right? Which we then see later in Valentinian systems, right? But it doesn't, in the Odes, this, this uh, phrase doesn't seem to have the same ideological content or valence as we find in, in the later Valentinian documents. And there's a mention of what we would translate as uh, what in Greek would be the eons, right? But they don't seem to, again, have the same valence that the emanational eons have in the later Gnostic systems, right? So uh, it, it, it's a messy terminology. You don't like it, but one could call this, you know, a proto, quote unquote, Gnostic, right? Uh, but I think that just muddies the water to even use this word gnosis and that in that sense, right? And of course, in the last generation, there's been an entire movement in 
critical scholarship even to like avoid this term Gnostic or Gnosticism and try to identify the group you're talking about. So don't call it Gnostic, call it Valentinian or Sethian, right? And so what can we call this? Uh, I'm really not sure. All we can do is we can narrow down the provenance, the geographical provenance to Syria. And um, that's something that I was able to, to clinch, right, during this project. Uh, for over a hundred years since these uh, hymns were rediscovered because they'd been lost for, for centuries. When they were rediscovered a little over a century ago, and since then there's a debate of the scholars. Well, what's the original language and where do they hail from? So there, some people think they're from Egypt, some people think they're from Syria. Um, I think I'm able to prove that they're from Syria and it's pretty astonishing Right, this is uh, how this can be done. Is and uh, since some scholars in this field are probably listening, I'll point it out. This Ode Forty One, verse six, mentions. Uh, well, it has this that uh, we are to meditate on His love by night and by day, which sounds like a reworking of Psalm One Two, right? Which says you to meditate in the Torah, right, day and night. But here in the ode, uh, the, it's switched. The, the transposition is switched to day, from night to day, right? Which is curious. And then there's the the bait preposition that prefixes each of those by night and by day. And astonishing, astonishingly, for over a century of scholarship of this, everyone has assumed this is a reworking of Psalm one two. No one. Uh, ever thought to look at Joshua 1.8, which is very, very famously a parallel to Psalm 1.2. When you do that and you look at the Syriac Peshitta translation of Joshua 1.8, you find it. You meditate in this book by night and by day, right? So, and this, th this sequence, right, is found in the versions of Joshua 1.8 nowhere except in Syria. So this is, uh, I, I think, almost virtual proof that, that the author right, uh, is uh, Syrian. And so these are composed in Syria. And personally, I think that there is, you can't say they were written originally in Syriac or originally in Greek. I think the author was bilingual and he produced them as a bilingual set. Right? And so in the Syriac we have, we can see Greek interference, which would be normal from a bilingual uh, scribe or speaker. And I think in the, the Greek, the one Greek ode that is preserved, uh, we can see Syriac uh, interference or influence. So they're from Syria, which is sort of a hotbed of like Gnostic-like Christian documents like the, the Acts of Thomas and all of this. So um, this is a very fascinating uh, set of documents. Right, today we have uh, four uh, pretty good manuscripts of the Odes of Solomon. Uh, the one that's in Greek, as Samuel mentioned, is Ode 11, and that was discovered in the 1950s and is uh, currently in the uh, uh, housed by the um, Bodmer Foundation. And then there is uh, there are five of the Coptic Odes uh, are preserved in the Pistis Sophia, where they are quoted. And then there are two uh, Syriac manuscripts from the Middle Ages, uh, the manuscript H, which was found by um, uh, J. Rendell Harris, kind of stacked up in his office somewhere when he picked it up and realized these were the Odes of Solomon. And then manuscript N. Right, yes, long lost, yes, that's right. And then manuscript, which contains almost all of the Odes in uh, Syriac, uh, except for the first two odes and probably part of uh, the beginning part of the third, and then manuscript N, which uh, contains a large chunk of them from chapter 17 to the end of the manuscript, but not the beginning uh, portions. And so the chapter one is only known from the Coptic, but so we have these three different languages, right? The Greek, the Syriac, and the Coptic. I think everyone agrees that the Coptic is a translation from, uh, most likely from Greek, uh, so there's, there's that question about the relationship between the Greek and the Syriac. And uh, as Samuel has said, it, it does seem uh, very evident that, um, that the, the same author uh, wrote, wrote both in Syriac and also in Greek. 
And that's the a Coptic, yeah. Coptic are, are found as quotations in the Pistis Sophia, the famous right, right. quote Gnostic text. Uh, incidentally, uh, Samuel mentioned terms like light that one finds frequently throughout the Odes of Solomon. The Syriac word for light is nura, uh, hence the, the URL that we've selected for our website dedicated to this project, and also the name of our translation, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the Nura translation, the Odes of Solomon. And um, the the version that I published in the uh, in my in my paperback is I can't see on the screen. Uh, the, the version I published in my paperback is actually an adaptation of the public domain translation that Samuel and I have placed out on this website and also on Academia uh, with uh, with some annotations by Samuel uh, digging into the uh, the text in a very uh, detailed level. And Samuel is also uh, working on a commentary. That, uh, that we're looking forward to seeing published as well. And, the, and the, this word Nuhra is the Syriac word for light. You know, it's, yes. it's, it's, it plays a very prominent role uh, th throughout the, the Odes of Solomon. You might uh, wonder why, if these are sort of supposed to be Odes sung by Jesus, why are they called the Odes of Solomon? I believe that that's completely intentional right uh, they're playing off the idea that the mashiach right would would be the ben david the son of david or the descendant of david and right who's the famous <coughs> son of david you know shlomo solomon right so it's sort of uh, a more tactful way than saying hey these are the odes of jesus right so these are the odes of solomon and they're famously in the manuscript tradition associated with <coughs> another fascinating set of documents called the Psalms of Solomon. These are purely Jewish, pre-Christian. Uh, but I do believe uh, I can make a good case, and in the commentary, I believe I make a good case, that shows that the Odes of Solomon actually depend on the Syriac translation of the Psalms of Solomon, another indicator of the Syrian provenance. Uh, but in any case, um, the, the reason I believe that this uh, the the author of the Odes of Solomon attached his new composition to the previously existing Odes of Solomon, right? It was just uh, it was sort of a a way to in the in the pre uh, printing press world, right? It was a way that he could associate his new work with a work that was already established, so uh, he could put it in circulation by associating it with a work already in circulation. And so I don't think it's it's um, an accident uh, that the Odes of Solomon came to be attributed to Solomon. I think they were were attributed to Solomon by their author, and then associated with the Ju pre-existing Jewish uh, Psalms of Solomon in order to get some publicity right, and exposure for this new work. What's also interesting there is that even the, the um, arrangement of the odes, there are 42 of them in three sets of 14, uh, 14 of course being the orthographic number of the name of David. And it's interesting that when you look in, for example, the, uh, the genealogy of Matthew's gospel, chapter one, verses one through 18, you've got the, the three sets of 14 for the Messiah's genealogy. So I think there's no, uh, no coincidence there either. Yeah, that's the, 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 the so-called gematria or numerical value of David in, in Hebrew being 14, uh, 14 times 3, 42. So there may be a, a hint at that in even the number of odes that were chosen for the collection. But, um, if you want to go to some uh, interesting or maybe even controversial ideas in these odes, I would say it's th there's this that's very interesting. Uh, not only controversial I'd say, on, on Christian theological grounds, but probably also related to that even among some uh, scholar uh, scholarship on these odes. And that is what involved what Mark was referring, mentioning uh, earlier, the tendency in modern translations of these odes to, to have labels. All right, verse three, Christ or Jesus speaks here. And then he speaks until verse 12, for instance. And then there it's the Odist or the narrator. Right? 
Well, I th uh, this this is uh, right, not in the any of the original manuscripts. This is just a totally modern convention that I think muddies the waters and, and causes confusion. But they were put in there, I think, in because uh, Christian translators were confused. How could Jesus say this? It can't be Jesus saying this, so it has to be the narrator, right? And that would be such things as, you know, these confessions of sin. Well, you know, because of the, the theology of the sinlessness of Jesus, which, of course, we know not all early followers of Jesus actually had this idea, but, you know, it, it, it became the orthodox idea, the standard idea. And so anything where a uh, confession of sin, uh, right, is being manifested, well, this can't be Jesus, right? But what, but even more interesting than that is that there are these passages where I think it's very clear that Jesus is the one who's supposed to be speaking, and yet he speaks of the, the, the Messiah, or the, the Messiah, the Messiah, as someone who is different from himself. And so this, for me, uh, seems to be a clue uh, uh, to the, the so-called Christology of the author. I believe that he makes a distinction between the man, Jesus, and the Messiah, which would probably be a, a celestial or a heavenly entity that descends and enters into Jesus at some point, right? Uh, whether it's at conception or at the baptism, which is never mentioned in these odes, or uh, let's say at the resurrection, that's another early, uh, early idea that we, that we hear of in church fathers like Irenaeus, right? But these were all lambasted. This idea is lambasted as a heresy of quote unquote Jewish Christians or Ebionites, right? Or, or, or uh, Corinthos uh, or uh, other enigmatic figures like that. So it seems to me that even though in recent years, the odes have even been adopted by some Christian uh, congregations, Right. Uh, who, who I think would find this maybe heretical, but this to me does seem to be the the author's viewpoint. Of course, right, one has to 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 be able to bring evidence and prove it. But uh, of course, that's what I do in my I try to do in in my commentary. But it does seem to me that there is a distinction between Jesus and the Messiah, right? In in these odes, as if Jesus were not the Messiah in an exhaustive sense, right? And of course, as you know, Second Temple Judaism, we have different ideas about what the Messiah would be. And we see like in the book of Enoch, in the parables of Enoch, it's this celestial entity in heaven by God. And we're not told, well, how in the world is that celestial Messiah going to get to the earth, right? For, for his earthly ministry, we're not told that, right? So there's no systematic uh, Christology there. Right, or messianology. Right, so uh, in, in any case, uh, so it would seem to me that the idea of the Messiah in the Oath of Solomon is this Enochic uh, idea that the Messiah is a heavenly entity and somehow becomes united uh, with, with this man, Jesus, who becomes the Messiah at some point, either at conception or at baptism or uh, resurrection. Well, uh, that said, there are certainly uh, areas in the text where there is an unannounced change of speaker. For example, yes. in Ode Eight, you know, the Odist is speaking, and then without um, without any uh, uh, without any uh, clue in the text, uh, in verse nine, the speaker switches to the first person voice of God, and then uh, back when it comes to, to verse twenty one. The voice of God sees this, and then the speaker shifts back to the oldest again. So I can certainly understand the uh, the interest in seeking, uh, looking to indicate where there may be a shift in speaker. Although, as Samuel said, hopefully uh, that's not going to be driven by theology, um, as a lot of other contemporary interpreters uh, insert these headings. And in our translation, we we didn't use any headings, so uh, which which makes it easier for the reader to draw. You know their own conclusions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Jacob, what do you think? Do you think that the 
Oza Solomon was written in stages by uh, several authors, uh, or do you think it was written entirely by one? I think there's a view that it was written in stages. I don't remember who holds that view. Well, I, th I think uh, you can make an argument that it was written in stages, but th there's one author and uh, the, the literary and uh, authorial unity is really the, the standard scholarly opinion. The, the st stylistically, it all adheres together. But also, um, Jesus, the name Jesus is never mentioned in any of these 42 odes. So I, I think it would be extraordinarily unlikely that you that this would just be a collection of disparate odes by early Christian authors, and then someone brought them all together, and not a single one of them mentions the name Jesus. It just uh, I, I I I can't buy it. I just use the vernacular oh. here. <clears throat> but yeah, I think yeah. chronologically, you there. I I think you can trace a chronological development that. Some of these, the earliest of these odes were probably written as early as uh, even the late first century. And then uh, the sort of like the military tone, right, seems to increase as you move along. And I think we're, we're starting to see in the later odes uh, echoes or, or statements indicative of some real military uh, event. And I think that's the Kytos War, 115 to 117, which even though it was centered in Egypt, right, it spilled over and the, the Jewish rebels actually won, uh, the, the leader, right, made his way to Judea, right? So, uh, but anyway, it seems to me that um, the, the Kytos War uh, is probably in the background and then maybe even f after the Kytos War, but before Bar Kokhba, but leading up to the Bar Kokhba Revolt. And it's mm. interesting, the, the final lines of the, the, of, 40, of the 42nd Ode, which is the end of the collection, right, talks about the, uh, the, the children of, of freedom, uh, which to me immediately brings to, line, to mind the slogans of the, on the Bar Kokhba coinage. So this is something that was out there, right? For uh, the for the freedom, right, uh, of Israel, right? But um, it um, so anyway. There, there's no way to to narrow down the dating, but to me, I think you can make a good argument that there's they were written over a period of decades, but I think by the same person. It will led you to conclude that he that the same author was writing in greek and syrian mm -hmm. syriac mm -hmm. yeah syriac yes right well you know it's it's, it's entirely possible that <clears throat> in uh some of these odes perhaps were written just in syriac and some just in greek and at some point right then he would he produced you know the translation in the other language when he finally came to com to compile them as a set of 42 odes, right, to be quote-unquote published or presented, right? So um, it, it's, it's possible, for instance, that one of the odes uh, right, was originally written in Greek and then yeah, a couple decades later when he finishes uh, this and gets the idea to have a collection that he wants to actually publish, that he makes sure each of them has a Greek and a Syriac version. Right, so that's certainly possible. Well, uh, a really good test case is the, the when we look at, at the Greek Ode, Ode 11, because that's the only one that we have in Greek and compare it to the Syriac. It's interesting that the, the, the quality of, of the Greek, you know, is, is not as good as, the, as that of the Syriac. Um, right. So uh, so that's one thing to consider. And a lot of the word plays are, are very interesting. And there's a really good example in, uh, in, in the Greek Ode 11, uh, which says in 1122a, everything is according to your will, whereas the Syriac reads, everything became like your remnant. So, you know, uh, many times, some of the more interesting conversations that we had was, you know, where the Syriac uh, diverges from the Coptic or the Greek, 
you know, in, in, uh, perhaps which reading was more original, you know, which one is, is the derivation. And in this case, the Greek term and the Syriac term, both uh, will and remnant uh, are amply attested in Semitic tropes. So either one could be original. But interestingly, the Greek word and the Syriac word are very close together. It sounds like a pun. So the, uh, the same author could have written both and in one context used the word will and the other used the word remnant. And uh, interestingly, when we think about, and again, we're, we're talking about poetic literature, we're talking about odes, think about contemporary musicians who might sing a song and may sing, sing the same song you know, in two different venues and use slightly different words. I think that, that also or, or is possible. different words. <laughs> Pardon? Or marketers, you think of Bob Dylan, um, yes. right? He's in versions of his songs that are 70, 80% different from the original, right? He, he creates entirely new uh, verses right, for, uh, as opposed to the original because you get tired of right, singing your, th th this song th you know, in the same way, right? For 20, 30, 40, 50 years, right? So. <laughs> Um, well, as you to the conclusion that it's most likely written or started being written during the Kittos War, is there details in, in the odes that seems to uniquely point to the Kittos War rather than Bar Kokhba? Well, the, of course, as I say, Mario, we, we can't be certain of any of this. And, uh, but, but as I said, I think that the earliest, <clears throat> the, the, some of the earliest of these odes chronologically could, could actually have been written right towards the end of even the first century, right? But as you move along in the collection, then the, this military uh, tone begins to increase, right? So this, uh, which a lot of um, devotees, let's say, of the odes of Solomon these days, uh, probably it doesn't register on them too much. Maybe they're just interpreting this as a spiritual warfare, but the Messiah, of the odes is the, I would say the typical uh, Jewish idea of the Messiah, right? As a warrior figure and as a political figure, right? And uh, so, but this begins to increase. So uh, it seems that the earliest odes really have this um, almost a tone of uh, maybe not lament, but there is sort of this, missing of the temple, right? That was destroyed in 70, the year 70 of the common era. And so, uh, but there is a confidence nevertheless, right? That, that God is still with us, right? Uh, even though the, the, the temple is gone, but the temple is mentioned. Um, uh, but as you proceed in the odes, this militaristic or military uh, tone begins to increase. And um, it, I don't see, we can't be certain, but I don't see any, anything that really more or less to me, uh, strong pointers uh, and allusions to Bar Kokhba, right? So, you know, if there were only some, you know, star imagery or something that, that we could point to, but, but there's nothing there about Kokhba being the, the Aramaic word for star. Um, so, um, um, if this, you know, if, if it's not Bar Kokhba, then, you know, it could be the Kytos War. And then the final ode, right, has this, and, oh, it starts to make me think of, um, it, it's remin it, it makes, one, makes me think of Bar Kokhba. But uh, there's not enough there to be certain. But so to me, it looks like we could interpret, right, this as you know the, all right so the idea of freedom uh was in the air and that's what led to the the in part to the bar Kokhba revolt right and so the odes end on this note of freedom of course it's expressed in theological terms or in religious terms right but uh, you know even the holy war right that's thought of in in, in religious terms as well so uh this this freedom though I believe does have a, a, a political dimension to it in the odes. So it's, it's a delicate balancing act, 
right? And and it's just you know, one theory among other possible ones. But I, I, I do, if you want to take a chronological development of the odes uh, and, and posit that it's written over 30, 40 years, let's say. Uh, so I would say there's a, a nostalgia for the temple in the earliest ones, a nostalgia for the temple destroyed in 70, <coughs> the common era. And then this militaristic tone pops up and so plausibly, right, this could be the Kaitos War since there are no strong pointers to Bar Kokhba. Uh, but if you keep this model of a chronological development that the decades are passing, and so at the end of the collection, there's this idea of freedom there. Uh, so maybe that's taking us to, you know, the late 120s, maybe, or around 130 even, though it's impossible to know. But, right, so... Bar Kokhba is about to emerge in all of that uh, 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 blood and, and war uh, and tragedy is, is about to unfold. So it's, it's just, just a, one theory among other possible theories, one, one way to sift through and interpret the evidence. But, uh, it's a very, uh, dating any of these early texts uh, from, from this period is, uh, is largely uh, hypothetical to theoretical, right? So. Well, and another interesting, uh, another, another uh, really um, compelling uh, you know, question, you know, hypothetical question, uh, when we're looking at the Odes of Solomon includes uh, Ode 2, the one that uh, is, mm -hmm. is missing in that we don't have any textual, um, you know, uh, attestation to it apart from uh, apart from potentially the, the Greek manuscript. And the reason being, uh, I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the manuscript H, which is our most complete collection of the odes, uh, picks up an ode three and goes to the end and doesn't have the first two odes. Ode one, we know from the Coptic, and that's the only um, manuscript we have that includes uh, at least a portion of uh, ode one, but, uh, but not ode two. Um, so, uh, you know, tr translators have resigned themselves to um, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, uncertainty about Ode Two, but uh, Samuel uh, has um, has both a very strong argument for Psalm Two um, having been uh, interpolated at least in part into Ode Eleven, and part of this involved a number of uh, Greek slashes in the manuscript that Samuel I puzzled over for, for quite some time, uh, trying to figure out what those slashes mean and also why there are you know uh, so many lines in Ode 11 that are not present in the Syriac Ode 11. Um, but are uh, in Greek. Right, right, right. Uh, so uh, uh, Samuel, uh, would you uh, uh, tell us a little more about that? Well, it's, just, uh, it's uh, at least among scholars of this, this document, it's famous that there are several extra lines in the Greek version of Ode 11, which are absent in the Syriac Ode, right? Uh, so the theory that I came up with that was suggested to me by the strange scribal markings in the, uh, in the Greek manuscript of Ode 11 is that uh, I, I came to the, the hypothesis that these extra lines in the Greek manuscript are actually the probably part or all of the lost ode two, and that somehow they, for some reason, uh, were were put accidentally or I, I think intentionally put into the Greek version of Ode Eleven. We can never be sure, but that's that's my theory, and uh, there there are several other arguments for it. Um, Another argument for it is the fact that. Uh, when you look at those extra lines from uh, Ode 11 and uh, uh, wonder if those could have been con constituted Ode 2, uh, the, the the content and the theme really fits between as a transition between Ode 1 and Ode 3. And we also know that those lines uh, are indeed uh, early because uh, they are uh, alluded to in a couple of other uh, second century texts, including uh, the Epistle of Barnabas. So, um, so, so we know that, that those, uh, that those texts, that, that those words from the Odes of Solomon were there in the second century, um, and, and yet we don't have them anywhere in the Syriac, so they had to have come from somewhere. 
and, and uh, uh, the O2 is probably the best place one could imagine those lines fitting. Hmm. Yeah, uh, another uh, another topic here that I'd like to raise is um, the it goes back to uh, what I began this conversation with Ode forty one verse six right, that uh, let us meditate in His love by night and by day right and so a lot of scholars have looked at that and said well all right so the the Odist has replaced the Torah with God's love. So this is sort of an anti, this is a Christian anti-Torah sentiment here, right? So, and, and it's been pointed out that the word law, namas, right, which would be the, the Greek and Greek loan word in Syriac word for Torah, right, is, is never mentioned in these odes. Right, so there's, you know, so the so the law is not of interest. The Torah is of no interest in the odes. But I think it's just, it's just totally uh, self-serving, right? Uh, depending on the the scholar uh, that we might be alluding to, um, the fact is that if you look at the Qumran Thanksgiving scroll, which is a lot longer, I think, than the forty-two odes of Solomon, right? The word Torah is you only find it like once or twice in that entire. Uh, system. Why? Because we know from Jewish uh, literature, from the Second Temple period, right? The uh, there was this proclivity for the use uh, of synonyms for Torah. Right. So uh, you could mention Torah, but often you would instead mention, you know, uh, up to a dozen maybe synonyms or or titles for the Torah. We see this already actually in Tehillim, in the Book of Psalms, in the Tanakh, Psalm 19. Uh, verses 8 through 10 uh, uh, starts off with, with the Torah of, of uh, Adonai is perfect. But then it goes on to use uh, five other synonyms. And then Psalm 119 has a group of, of seven synonyms for the Torah. So you often will not mention the Torah, but you will mention things like the word right, of God or the, the commandments or the, 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 the regulations, right? So you have, you have all of these titles for the Torah. And so this is what we do see profusely throughout the Odes of Solomon are mentions of the divine word, right? Uh, and also several other traditional uh, Jewish titles for the Torah. And love is one of these titles for the Torah. And actually that one is actually inspired by uh, is um, so by Psalm 1 2, even though the actual echo uh, of by night and by day is from Joshua 1 8, the concept of love is actually then derived from the parallel in Psalm 1 2. And that is, right, the, the Hebrew text there says, <coughs> uh, that, you know, blessed is the, the person, etc., etc., that he meditates, his delight right, is to meditate in the Torah of Adonai by well, day and night. But this term delight, for instance, if, if you look at the Coptic translation, right? So the Coptic word for delight, this verb, can also be translated as love. And you can see the semantic overlap, right, between delight and love, because delight is a big part of love, especially the, the, the act of, of love making and everything around and associated with it. So, uh, and also it's not only in that document, but uh, there are several other Jewish documents that, that I cite in my commentary where, where actually love is actually a title for the Torah in, in uh, Jewish tradition. So uh, they're, they're, I think these odes are much more Jewish than even scholars who call them Jewish Christian uh, have realized. The, the, there's much more of an interest in the Torah and all this bubbling up in water imagery that we find throughout the Odes, that's also a very traditional uh, uh, image associated with the Torah, because in Hebrew, this word for Torah, right, can actually etymologically be associated with concepts of water and flowing and rain, right? So maybe some of our uh, non-scholarly uh, audience will know, for instance, that the uh, passage from the prophet Joel about uh, rain in righteous measure, in just measure, 
uh, was read at Qumran as a reference to the teacher of righteousness or the righteous teacher. So there is this association between water symbolism and the Torah and is profuse throughout the Odes. So there's a lot of interest actually in the Torah in these Odes. Why do you think this text was written? What was the general point the author was trying to make? Well, again, this is a, we can only guess. I actually have this, this suspicion um, that they may have been composed uh, for reading d during the, the Festival of Sukkot, the you know, Festival of Tabernacles, right, which is going to be coming up not too far from now. But anyway, um, Uh, I, I can't prove that, but there is a lot of th this water imagery right, that I mentioned that pertains to the Torah, right? Is uh, along with the, the the imagery and symbolism of light uh, and and other core group of symbols. Also, right, it's very Sukkot like imagery, uh, right? There's the water libation during during the festival, tabernacles, the, the lighting of the huge menorahs in the, in the at the temple. Right, which were famous for that. So the, there may be a connection there. And of course, right, if a, you could have a certain number of these odes that would have been read on each day of Sukkot, right? And then you could bring you uh, up to the total of 42. But that, that's just, uh, you know, just a suspicion of mine. But, um, you know, if you want to muse about possible... Um, reasons why these were written the the author was absolutely definitely clearly um, a master um, poet this, this poetry is exquisite uh, except for uh, you know the uh, i would say the, the greek version the the greek text that we have early 11 has some some really um uh it's not very mechanical Paul, yeah, it's not very polished. When you look at the Syriac, it's just uh, is a master poet. But he doesn't seem to have quite the same level of skill in Greek. So which leads me to believe that, right, Syriac, he had more mastery of Syriac than, than Greek. That's, that's very often the case with bilingual speakers. They'll be more fluent in one of the languages uh, as opposed to, in contrast to the other, right? But so th he was a poet and, um, and obviously, he would have written other works right, that apparently do not survive. I don't think any poet just has like 40 poems or 40 hymns that they wrote. Uh, the, the, you know, you have to have practiced before you could have, you know, achieved this level of mas linguistic mastery and, uh, and poetic mastery and the techniques and all of that. But he's definitely a scribe because he knows his Tanakh. Um, and um, and also, but he's, he's attributing these to to Jesus, but, but but never using the name. So he he's a member of the, the Jesus movement. And Charlesworth thinks uh, that he was actually maybe a convert, or he originally was from Qumran, right? And um, um, it's well, it, it, it's a little difficult. That's a little difficult chronologically, uh, but maybe I think that maybe his, you know, his parent, his father, maybe, right, could have been from Qumran, and so he was raised with some of these Qumran influences, and I think he he had access to some documents we see at Qumran, like like well, definitely the uh, Qumran Thanksgiving scroll, the hymn scroll. Right, this the, the uh, author, the Oath of Solomon, I think certainly knew this scroll uh, and meant a lot to him personally. And so maybe the idea was that, yeah, Jesus is like the return of the teacher of righteousness, who knows, right, or, or whatever. But um, so, uh, yeah, I think chronologically, it make better sense that maybe, you know, like his, his, Parents or grandparents, his father or grandfather, like, you know, had been an Essene, right? Um, and, you know, not necessarily from Qumran because, right, we can't, 
you can't equate Qumran and Essenism. There were Essenes, you know, throughout Judea and Syria, right? And uh, and and scholars debate about the identity of Qumran. Was it the the beginning of the Essene? sect of Judaism, a group of Judaism, or was it a heretical breakaway from the mainstream Essenes who lived in the villages throughout uh, Judea, for instance? So that's, that's something that, but we, so we cannot equate Qumran with Essenes. There were Essenes, uh, uh, you know, who did not live there and, they, uh, and maybe uh, did not, uh, maybe even disagreed, right, with um, the Qumran sect's extreme anti-temple administration uh, position, right? Because they, they broke away from, uh, at least one group broke away from the, the temple. Uh, this was probably um, about a uh, hundred years before the common era, right? So scholars used to push back the, uh, the emergence of the teacher of righteousness earlier, but uh, I think uh, more recent arguments really, I think are, putting it at about a hundred years, right, before the, the turn of the common era, right? And so, um, so, maybe, yeah, so I, I think maybe there's some continuity here for the author between his, maybe his parents' generation or grandparents' generation and, and the whole uh, Jewish war and Essenes, uh, right, and the new Jesus movement, which, which he is a member of, uh, and he's creating a continuity, right, between that her his her personal heritage and this new movement. Well, uh, in, in addition to that, um, clearly this, these uh, odes have a liturgical significance. Each of the odes is followed by the word hallelujah, and uh, in, in the Syriac that's indicated by a little notation. Uh, and it's, uh, it, so it clearly has liturgical usage and the community component of it where the speakers are speaking in the first person uh, plural, you know, uh, and, and praising the Lord, you know, uh, under, underscores that as well. And um, in addition, and this is why this text is just so fascinating, because in addition to all of these uh, resonances with the uh, Jewish context of the Odes, there is so much in here that is of great interest to, to Christians as well, uh, you know, thinking about uh, in, in th Christian theological reflection and questions about uh, the divine feminine, for instance. Uh, interestingly, you know, they always talk about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, including uh, uh, most notably in uh, Ode 19. But the word uh, spirit in Syriac, of course, Syriac doesn't have the neuter gender like Greek. And uh, as in Hebrew, so in Syriac, the word for spirit is feminine. And the Holy Spirit is consistently displayed in feminine terms. Uh, throughout the Odes of Solomon. And in fact, what, uh, the, the spirit was regarded as feminine in the Syriac church up through the through, for the f first several centuries of the common era, as well as the questions about, say, the doctrine of the atonement. You know, in Christian circles, we talk about you know, different theories of atonement, you know, penal substitutionary atonement, you know, uh, different theories of atonement. And coming to a text like the Odes of Solomon and looking at these texts and asking, you know, what did the, what did the death and uh, vindication of the Messiah mean in these texts? Uh, clearly, there's no idea of uh, a penal substitutionary you know, satisfaction uh, theory of atonement there. But we do have features that scholars have described as the harrowing of hell or the classic or dramatic theory where, uh, where the Messiah uh, uh, it goes to, uh, into, uh, into Hades and, uh, and, and uh, uh, emerges victorious over the serpent and crushes the serpent and then is vindicated. And, and of course, all of that language is very much at home in, uh, in Hebrew texts in Ezekiel 38 in the uh, in, in, uh, 1QHA, you know, uh, but uh, the, mm. the resonances and the, the, uh, the meaning for Christian theological questions in the history of the church is equally interesting you know, from my perspective. All right. Well, there's this dragon that is mentioned in the odes. Uh, there's there's this dragon or serpent, but there's also other uh, figures in there, like personified error, personified deception, or deceit. Um, when you put that together, uh, you get something that's parallel in the book, throughout the book of Revelation. 
right? And so there it's anti-Roman. So it's very political. And I believe this is what we see in the Odes of Solomon. It's this anti-Roman uh, ideology at work or sentiment at work, right? So th there is this, uh, I believe that this deception and error um, personified are correspond the correspond to the Roman emperor and symbolize a Roman imperial uh, religion, polytheistic religion, right, from the Jewish perspective. And so I think there, right, this this is more evidence. A lot of uh, scholars, uh, I don't think that they're 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 recognizing enough of the political dimension uh, in this work. So this is this is anti-Roman. And um, we see, I believe, some echoes of uh, earlier uh, of another early text. It's called the Apocalypse of Peter, the Revelation of Peter. Baucham dates it to uh, the Bar Kokhba revolt. I think, uh, along with some uh, other scholars, that is actually from the Kytos, uh time, the war, the, the the time of the Kytos war. But in any case, uh, it does look like the the Ode of Solomon has knowledge of this Apocalypse of Peter, which is also, whenever it was written, it is also an anti-Roman uh, document. <coughs> and the, <coughs> excuse me, the Antichrist-like figure in the Apocalypse of Peter is definitely the Roman emperor, right? It's, it's not... Uh, a, a Jewish false prophet or something like this. It's it's a it's an attack on the Roman emperor of the time. And so I believe that we're seeing the same thing in the Odes. So this was something that was being done at the time <coughs> that the Odes of Solomon were written. There were these uh, very veiled attacks against the Roman system uh, the, politically, that is the emperor, and religiously, that is the the, relig the uh, Roman priesthood and uh, the whole sacrificial system and all this. So we have these uh, these symbols of you know de defeating the dragon and all of this. The, these are anti-Roman militarist. These are militaristic political uh, viewpoints at work. Samuel, wouldn't you say that Ode 23 is a great uh, you know, meeting place of all of those uh, questions? Yes. And, uh, yes. and, and it's very curious um, uh, hermeneutical questions about the angelic wheel that we find in that Ode as well. And, and, and some, I know some of the translation points in Ode 23 are, are, are tricky, you know, uh, and I think yes. that, uh, that that Roman context makes a lot of sense there. Yes, yes. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think there's some definite conflict going on there too as well. Also containing a lot of very fascinating um, traditions that can relate to the Merkava, right? So this will that comes down, uh, you know, uh, other scholars have recognized that it seems to be Ezekiel's will, right? The, the Merkava, right? And um, right, it, it descends right, to, to the earth and becomes this like weapon of war, right, it's annihilating the enemies, like, because it, uh, and that makes sense because in the, uh, a lot of scholars don't recognize this, but uh, th th there's a really great essay that was published, uh, forgive me, I forget the author's name, just uh, not too many years ago, pointing out that in the book of Genesis, in the story of Eden, where you have the cherubim, the cherub, with the uh, with the flaming sword right if you look at the hebrew text he's arguing that the the enigmatic hebrew construction about this uh describing this flaming sword is that it's rotating right so but he he didn't put two and two together to realize that wow all right so uh well he he says well, it's a symbol for the a chariot wheel which is what the merkava is the the wheels of the merkava are wheels of well, the wheels in Ezekiel are the wheels of the Merkava, the, the chariot of God. But this this wheel in Genesis, uh, the the sword, flaming sword, rotating is a hint. He says at the sky wheel of the Persian war chariot. So it's this right. So you may be seen it on some movies, right, in Rome or ancient Rome or something. The chariots have swords or something, right, blades coming out of the wheels and they just mow down everything uh, on their two sides, right? And so this is what it looks like is happening in Ode 23, 
this divine Merkava, this Merkava wheel is coming down and just mowing everything down. Another Jewish um, uh, tradition that you see in there is at the end of it, right, which has this very quote unquote Christian sounding, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit or Spirit of Holiness uh, to, 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 uh, to, to go with the Syriac reading. Um, but what, what is stated right before that, what introduces it is an allusion to the Kedusha, right? So Kodesh, 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 Holy, 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 right? from, from, uh, from Isaiah 6, right? Which is in the, the, the Jewish liturgy and, and all the, the, the higher liturgical Christian churches. So what it looks like uh, he's doing there is associating the, the Father, Son, and Spirit which I don't believe by any stretch of the imagination he conceives of in classical Christian Trinitarian terms. It's not, he doesn't see these as three persons of God, you know, so, but anyway, he's associating uh, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, you know, with the three instances of the Kodesh, with, the, with, with this uh, part of the Jewish liturgy, right? And uh, he, he actually knows it, I believe, from the Jewish liturgy. Uh, but in any case, it's uh, the Ode 23 is, is really fascinating. It's um, a lot of it's really heavily disputed because it's, it's very enigmatic. It starts off with this letter, this epistle, uh, which then descends to earth and then the wheel shows up and mows everything down and it ends up on this, what sounds like a Trinitarian note. Anyway, it's very fascinating. Uh, I, I think a lot of readers of the Odes a lot of quote unquote devotees, the odes, they read it and they come, across, they come away just remembering and being impressed with all of the luscious uh, poetic images of light and love and truth and all of this. And they have sort of like a cognitive dissonance, I suppose. They just, they forget apparently about all the, the militaristic imagery uh, the dragon being defeated, uh, the Messiah who's like a warrior. Maybe they just tend to spiritualize it, spiritualize it away, right? Uh, and not recognize so like the anti Roman, so the political uh, and militaristic uh, mindset that is there. That for the author, obviously, was totally compatible with all the talk about love and the word of God and light imagery and exaltation and joy, right? Well, uh, again, uh, reflecting on the language of the chariot, you know, and uh, Merkaba mysticism, you know, one of my favorite uh, lines in the Odes of Solomon is Ode 38.1, where the Odes says, I went up into the light, the Nura of truth, as into a chariot. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's very clearly, you know, uh, coming out of the same tradition and reflects many other uh, second century texts like uh, the Apocryphon of James with Jesus ascending in a spirit, uh, the chariot of the spirit, or in uh, first Enoch 70, Enoch, you know, going up in uh, chariots of the spirit, um, you know, even uh, referring back to, uh, you know, um, Elijah's uh, flaming uh, chariot, uh, that, that chariot mysticism. And there's a lot of mystical language in uh, the Odes of Solomon that is very much at home with both uh, uh, Jewish and Christian mysticism. I'd also point this out too. Uh, th this again, uh, when I think of the many modern or, or let's say contemporary Christian churches that have adopted these odes as actual hymns that they now sing in their church services. One thing to keep in mind is that I think a lot of uh, many Christians probably don't, rec uh, don't appreciate this point, right? And that is, these odes are God-centered, right? So these are odes, yes, of Jesus, but he is praising God. He's praising his Father. He's praising God. So these are not hymns that praise Jesus. These are not Jesus-centered. These are not Christ-centered. These are God-centered, right? So um, I, I, I think uh, several... Christian theologians uh, that I read uh, in my university days and before I right, had pointed out this basic scenario, right? So uh, if you look at, let's say, the Sermon on the Mount and things like this, right? So Jesus is teaching this sermon, right? And this is all centered on God, right? Uh, and so what, what happens later in Christianity in general, I would say, is that then 
there's a tendency to make Jesus the center of this new group, this new quote unquote religion. And of course, right, Paul, we see, we see the, I think the, the earliest phases of that in the letters of Paul. Jesus is becoming very central, even though it's still not in the same way that, that happens later in, in history. Uh, so, right, so how is it stated? It's all right, so the religion of Jesus, right, was, was Judaism. I mean, the center of everything is God, right? Um, and then Jesus gets turned into a religion. Right, and so the theology is, uh, becomes obsessed with the nature of Jesus, and all the councils were called, right, and convened. So how, how do we understand the nature of Jesus? Who he was, his nature, how, you know, all of this, which I don't have to go into. But the odes uh, are not about praising Jesus. There really is no. Uh, these are Jesus. Yeah. So yeah, it's from the Jesus group, but they're all. He is praising God. His father, so it's God-centered, and so that's another Jewish aspect uh, of these uh, of, of, of these odes. Right. Of course, of course, that's also true of uh, much of the New Testament, and uh, certainly of the Scriptures generally. And uh, the the, uh, the trend of uh, churches um, adapting the odes of Solomon or using the odes of Solomon, I think, is also a, a positive trend as well, uh, because there's there's just so much beauty there that we can be appreciated across. You know, sure. uh, uh, denominational lines, and uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Samuel Lamb wanted to focus on in the Nura project is, uh, you know, uh, uh, interdisciplinary and interfaith components as well. That there are, you know, uh, there there's much that these uh, odes have to contribute toward uh, our understanding of Judaism, our understanding of Christianity, and even of Islam as well. So uh, there's there's some of those components also. Yes. 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 Final question. Um, from where where in the Odes of Solomon does it seem to indicate that it could be that the author of it was regarding Jesus as the return of the righteous teacher? Well, th th there really isn't I anything specific. It's just the, the mm -hmm. overall <clears throat> impression, right? So the, the Qumran hymns, uh, scholars like Charles Worth, and, and I, uh, I, I'm convinced by his argumentation, right, which I've been studying since the 80s. Um, you know, the author was familiar with the with the Qumran hymns, right? And what are those Qumran hymns? Right? They are the hymns of the of the righteous teacher, the teacher of righteousness. Uh, or at least put into his mouth, right, as in an act of homage to to the deceased founder of that group, right? And so uh, the odes now are basically transforming, reworking a lot of the ideas and, and lexical content of the Qumran hymns, right, which is associated with the righteous teacher, into, right, to the mouth, of, in putting it into the mouth of Jesus, Right, and so it's just uh, it, it's it's just a likely scenario in my a scenario in my opinion that perhaps right we it, it's plausible to suspect that the author is somehow assimilating the righteous teacher with Jesus, and so it's it's just a guess of mine. Well, maybe you know he uh, or he inherited this idea from his his parents or grandparents' generation or whatever, was that um, that Jesus is somehow like the teacher of righteousness. Jesus is now uh, sort of like, the, the, was the leader of some new movement, some new group. Of course, from a Jewish perspective, it would just be, well, right? We have the Sadducees, we have the Pharisees, we have the Essenes, now we got another group, right? The, these following, uh, you know, Jesus or, or Yeshua, right? And, um, so this this new group follow, uh, of Jews following Jesus, uh, maybe they, they were able to make the transition from the Essene movement to this new Jesus movement by somehow comparing Jesus to the righteous teacher, or to the teacher of righteousness. Right? And I'm not the first scholar who's who's mused that some Essenes may have made a transition to the Jesus movement 
by somehow seeing Jesus, comparing Jesus to the righteous teacher, or even seeing Jesus perhaps as some kind of reappearance, right, of the, of the righteous teacher. I mean, there, there's a lot of debate about that, right? Was there an expectation that the righteous teacher would return, right, or or, or would have a successor or, or whatever? So there's endless debate about that. Or the, the righteous teacher could have just been the paradigmatic, you know, uh, background for this description of, of Jesus. But the, the, certainly the relationship between the, this text and, uh, and the Qumran text and uh, uh, like, um, as I mentioned earlier, the Jahanine literature just raises all kinds of fascinating questions about this little understood uh, broad movement uh, where, where clearly there were these baptismal sects growing out of uh, Judea. That, and there was a lot of cross pollination of uh, of ideas, and uh, the so the Odes of Solomon uh, affords us an excellent opportunity mm -hmm. to consider these uh, these uh, resonances and yeah, relationships. I, mean, I, I, I I have connected one of the Odes with the uh, it's it's a, it gives us a nice parallel to the very famous at least among you know Qumran scholars very famous self what's called the self glorification him where someone describes his ascent into heaven and, and sits down on this throne and and he's higher than the angels right and so there is this uh, a parallel to that right in the odes of solomon where the odist right in parentheses jesus right describes his ascent uh into heaven and actually <clears throat> there in that ascent is, he is born of the Holy Spirit, who is thought of as the, the celestial or the heavenly mother. So he's actually born uh, during, so he, he's born as some kind of heavenly figure, divine figure, uh, in, during, uh, as a part of his, his like, Merkava uh, ascent. That's uh, 036, so right? It's fascinating. So th there's another connection there. My own suspicion is that this self-glorification hymn is either uh, describing the experience of the righteous teacher or is written and it's supposed to be read as if it's a description, right, of the righteous teacher's heavenly ascent and glorification. But well, that's, you know, you really have to really argue that very carefully, but that's, a, that's certainly a possibility. And so I think we see uh, a parallel to that and so I, th I think it's an influence from the self-glorification hymn in the Odes, where this, in parentheses, Jesus describes his own ascent into heaven, where he gets born right, in, in, a, in a divine mode, right? So that's, I think, where he becomes the quote-unquote son of God, right? And so it, it, we see this is, this is a very early Jewish Christian uh, uh, concept of, of Christ, that he becomes the Messiah in his resurrection, which is really no nothing different from his ascent up to, into heaven. That is what the resurrection is, according to this early paradigm. And I think that's the paradigm in the Oaths of Solomon. There is no resurrection, and then 40 days later, there's an ascent. Now, the, 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 the transition from death to life is... The, the ascension, the resurrection, it's the same thing. The resurrection is the ascent to God, right? So I, I, that's a very early Christology. That's when I think the Messiah is united with Jesus, when Jesus somehow ascends, ascends to heaven, probably spiritually, but I mean, there's, the odes don't give us enough evidence, you know, did, 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 did the author think that Jesus' resurrection was physical or just spiritual or what? Right. It doesn't go there. But well, certainly one thinks about the uh, early uh, Christological uh, concepts uh, implied in portions of, for example, the book of Acts, where in Acts 2, uh, God made this, this Lord, this, this Jesus Lord and Christ in his resurrection, or even Romans 1, 3, you know, with the sonship being tied mm -hmm. to the resurrection. So there are definitely traces of that early, uh, you know, Christology in uh, yes. various other places as well. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Well, thank you both for joining me today. This has been a fascinating discussion. And I'm sure it, uh, there's plenty of people out there that's probably never heard of the Odes of Solomon. And I remember uh, 
I don't think I've heard of it until I actually looked at the work of Charles Worth and became more familiar with it. What fascinates me about Charles Worth's collection, especially in huge volumes of it, is like the Old Testament Supergraph, for example, volumes one and two, mm. includes a lot of very interesting material. I think uh, people would uh, enjoy reading, including also uh, reading as well the Odes of Solomon. Because uh, there's a lot of fascinating Old Testament apocrypha floating around out there. Yes, yes, yes. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.